Words are powerful. Even just a simple greeting is so powerful. Often words convey so much meaning. They can evoke emotion. They can lead someone to action. We are, we're talking about words today and specifically the word today. And so I got me thinking about this idea of how important words are. A few weeks ago, a friend of mine invited me to go with her to Hermiston and it was on MLK Day and we got to participate in the MLK march and um, the speeches, the rally that happens. In fact, I didn't know this, but it happens in Hermiston every year, and it's been going on for, for almost a decade or more there. And it was so um, interesting to just listen to the words that were being spoken. As we were walking, we just marched around probably a f- three, four neighborhoods. Um, we could hear a mom behind us talking to um, her child about why we were marching and the history of the civil rights movement and why that was needed. And, And their daughter was asking questions and she was explaining. And then when we got to, um, the location where they had the speeches, we, we got to hear all these different experiences, these words that described the history, words that described um, what was and also the present, experiences of people that people have had with racism and what that was like in their lives. And those words were powerful. In the end, um, towards the end of our time there, they played a clip of Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech probably guess which one, right? The I have a dream speech and those words, I have a dream repeated, um, convey so much meaning and again, evoke so much um, emotion because there are words that embodied what Martin Luther King stood for in the civil rights movement. I don't know if you know, but February is Black History Month. So This would be, I mean, any time is a good time to learn more about our history. But um, certainly in February, Black History Month is a great time to to read and listen to the powerful words of people who've worked so hard in our country for and in the world to bring about equality in, in a more just world. So I've been thinking a lot about the power of words and then someone handed me a microphone. No pressure there, right? <laughs> um, thankfully, it's not all about uh, not all about us and what we say up here. But we want to dive in today into the powerful words that John wrote, and we're going to be looking today at the first chapter or the first section um, in chapter one of John. We're going to dive straight in today. If you weren't here last week, I'd encourage you to jump on the website and find either the audio or or video version of uh, the the message that introduces John, the author, the context, and all of that. Today, we're going to begin with John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and through the world, and though, I'm sorry, and though the world was made through him, the world did not receive him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning Him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because He was before me. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. 
For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. What a powerful introduction to the Gospel of John. I was a third grade teacher, and I would teach kids how to write little introductions. And it was nothing like this, right? A little topic sentence and your three details. Like it was super prescribed, just informative to give the reader information. This is not that. This is a piece of poetry. John writes to to draw the reader in. It's meant to be heard and experienced. It's meant to evoke emotion and, and foster thinking and questions and ponderings. And John in this in this section here draws the reader in with metaphor. And he builds upon metaphors and he alludes to Old Testament passages and he alludes to Israel, the Israelite history. His purpose is to get people's attention and get them really listening and thinking about meaning. So we'll spend the next few minutes this morning breaking down and trying to understand, interpret exactly what is he saying and what is the audience, the original audience hearing as John writes these words. First three verses, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. In the beginning. John believes that for us to know who Jesus is, you have to go all the way back to the beginning. You see, this entire gospel that John's writing is describing to us who Jesus is with the express purpose. John says, I'm writing this so that you would believe in his name, so that you would believe in Jesus and find life in him. So John, as he begins to describe who Jesus is, starts at the beginning. Now, in the, an, an original audience, especially a Jewish audience in that time, would hear these words and know these are the very first words in Scripture. In the beginning, God did what? God created. God created the heavens and earth. And how did God go about creating in this poetic telling of the creation of the world? He spoke it into existence. God's words created in the beginning. So what John is doing here is inviting us to imagine a God who is speaking creation into being, and now he'll play off and build upon this idea of the word of God that is going out into the world. This word is logos, and it means it can be translated as word. It can also be translated as the reasoning of a person or the message of a person. And so in this very poetic piece, John describes the word, and and he he's specific about certain things. He says, first of all, the word existed in the beginning. And then he says, the word was God. And the word was with God. Now, for, for a human, that's like, wait a second, how can, can, how can you be a person and also distinct from that person? And yet, this is how John describes the word, which we will find out very soon is, is referring to Jesus. That the word was both God and was distinct from God, meaning was with God in the beginning and then went out from God. So we begin to catch a glimpse here of Trinitarian theology, the idea of a trinity, a God that is one and is also three. Now, if we were to go back and read the Genesis account, we would see two agents pretty readily, right? We would see God, uh, and we would see the Spirit of God that's hovering over the chaotic waters. The language used there is like this this disturbed, chaotic, undeveloped space. And God is speaking order into this chaotic world, right? But the third agent, John, is identifying for us in the very beginning of his gospel here. He says, God's word, which was distinct from God and was also God, was there in the beginning. Speaking into existence, uh, God was creating the world. This third agent, uh, the word, uh, will soon find, becomes flesh, takes on human form later in history. Verse 4, in him, the word, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. 
in him was life. That's a pretty bold statement, but it makes sense here in this, in this context of creation. And we'll see that life is a really major theme in the Gospel of John. In fact, you alluded to it, the, the, what Micah spoke about last week was the purpose of this Gospel was so that people would believe in Jesus, that he's the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, people would have life. So from the very beginning, John identifies that the word is life, that there is life when we're in the word. Additionally, the idea of light is brought into the conversation, and this will be common throughout the book, and we'll wait to develop the details of the theme of light as it continues to come up in the text. But for today, as we look back at Genesis, and John draws our attention to Jesus, even in the telling of creation, uh, we'll recognize this. Uh, we talked about the chaotic waters and God is speaking order into them. Well, one of the things God says is, let there be light. And you can imagine in that moment, from all the darkness and the chaos and the fear that darkness can invoke, light now shines into this world that God is creating. And what John is saying, in the same way, Jesus come to earth, God born in human flesh will be a light that shines on the darkness in this, in this world. And where there is chaos, where there is disorder, where there is darkness, Jesus can and will be a light shown into this world. And what a beautiful promise for, for us when we're feeling the darkness around us, that there is no darkness that Jesus, the true light, cannot overcome. It continues in verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. And so John makes clear that, that John is the witness to the word, the witness to the light that is life. His purpose was to tell people about Jesus um, so that they would believe in Jesus. However, that John himself was not the light. He was not the word that he's speaking of. He only came as a witness to it. And we'll, we'll, look, we'll talk more about John next week. Verse 9, the true light that gives light to everything was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, those to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. So Jesus comes into the world, the world that Jesus created, and he's not recognized. The creator comes to the created and is not recognized by that which he created. He's not received this word that brings life, this word that brings light, that pierces through the darkness, was not accepted, was not received. And I think this is really significant um, as in our understanding of God and who, who God is, that God gives humanity a choice. God gives us a choice as well, that the creator has all the power to force creation in doing whatever the creator wants to do, right? Like in theory, but that's not how God operates. Instead, we serve a God that operates out of invitation and, and, and comes and brings light and life and offers the invitation, and some will refuse, in fact, he says many will refuse, but some will receive him. They will accept his name. And uh, in so doing, they will be given the right to become children of God. And this word, given the right, like the privilege of, like this is something great, really struck me this week. I think to our ears, we might not hear the radical invitation and, and claim that John is making in this text. You see, in a first century, in an ancient Israelite world, uh, to be invited into, adopted into the family of God is a great and beautiful invitation and promise. You see, in a culture based upon honor, it was the goal of an individual 
individual to bring honor to their family's name. I, I do not want to misbehave. I do not want to do wrong things, not because I'm afraid of the legal system and the law like our culture would typically, that would be uh, the deterrent. Instead, in a culture like Israel's in the first century, the highest goal was to bring honor and avoid bringing shame to your family to your name. And so he says here, so those who would believe in the name of Jesus would receive his name. They would be children of God. They would be adopted into his family. And this uh, has implications on two different opposite ends of this. First of all, it is a great honor to be given that name. And secondly, I would want to live in a particular way to uphold that name. The honor would be given to the God who has adopted me. And so the new family then would mean a new identity, a new way of being. You know, each family kind of has their own family dynamics. In fact, sometimes we joke around about, yeah, you know, family dynamics. Every family's, every family's a little bit different. Every family's got them. You know, one of the most interesting things about dating someone and then marrying them is that you kind of gain a new family, right? And vice versa. And so you have to kind of learn, okay, this family, this is, this is how, how this family works. For better or worse. I think that was in our vows. Well, right? Yeah, for better or worse. Did it apply to family? Or? It goes vice versa. Okay. It, it goes right. both ways here. <laughs> um, but there are those aha moments, you know, as you're getting to know someone in someone's family, like, oh, that's why you do that. That's why you say that. And so here, as we're talking about being adopted into God's family, We're adopted into a new identity, a new way of being in which this family has particular habits and practices and modes of communication that, that we are invited to participate in because being invited into God's family changes everything that it changes how we think. It changes how we think of each other, how we treat each other. We're invited into a new way of living as a family that reflects God's character that is full of life and love and light. Now, what John is describing is called the gospel. That simply means the good news. Uh, The story that John is is attempting to tell in in this account is a story of humanity torn from the presence of God by their own will, by their own decision, by sin and darkness and destruction in this world, ripped from the presence of God and a God in pursuit of restoring relationship, walking with humanity again. And so the question comes, how will God bring this light into the world? How will he heal a broken broken and hurting world. And in verse 14, it says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The means by which God would bring salvation, new hope, and light into this world would be by taking on human flesh and walking amongst us. The word used here uh, is actually the word tabernacle, which is really significant in Israel's history. Uh, What the text says is, the word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. That is, he set up his tent among us. Now, the the tabernacle had significant implication in the life of Israel. Absolutely. And the tabernacle, and then they built the temple. It was a meeting place where, where the Israelites would go to meet with God. So if you wanted to meet with God, if you wanted to speak to God, if you wanted to hear from God, if you wanted to engage in relationship with God, that is where you went, to the tabernacle, to the temple. And his uh, the the hearers of the gospel of of John here would have been very familiar with all the temple practices um, that the Israelites that the Israelites had, and so it's super significant that the Word, who is God, the Word becomes a human temple, the Word tabernacled amongst us. Why? To meet with humanity. And this is the beautiful thing that I, that I see in here that the creator takes on the form of the created so that they can have face to face conversations. So we can meet, we can talk that this is a God who is not distant and far away, but rather a God who comes very near and is very approachable that wants to be approached and wants to have conversation. And so having tabernacled amongst us, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. 
John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who is himself God and in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. So the word became flesh. God comes to dwell with humanity, and the result is that people have seen the one and only Son, who came from the Father, that people have seen God, have seen Jesus. So we have the word here that is equated to the light of humanity, is equated to life, is also called the one and only Son. And then here in verse 17 will be identified as Jesus Christ, meaning the Savior, the Messiah, and so it's just beautiful how God comes near. It's, it's specific here in, also. It says that we have seen the one and only son who came from the father. And so you have this imagery of a parent, a God who exists in relationship, who is three in one. It's hard for us to understand this idea of a triune God. There's a whole lot of mystery there. And, and we see all throughout John, Jesus calling God his father, my father. Why this metaphor? Why this imagery? It is one of nearness and one of closeness. It is an image to help us understand the nearness and closeness of the, this triune God. It's also true that this language and this imagery can, can also be um, limiting. And sometimes when we use it regularly, it can bring up some misconceptions and some confusion. For instance, fathers exist before sons, right? In that, I mean, by nature, human nature, and yet that's not the case in the Trinity. Jesus was with God in the beginning. Um, usually, fathers have more power, more authority than their children. But that's not the case in the Trinity. The Trinity is a relationship of equality and mutuality. The term father specifically refers to a male, and yet God is spirit. God doesn't have a male body or a female body. So why is it that John here is using uh, this imagery, and Jesus uses this imagery in calling God his father? is to describe the closeness of their relationship, to describe the nearness of the Trinitarian God. Okay, John identifies that grace and truth come through Jesus. Uh, He mentions grace upon grace. This in reference to the Old Testament law, which is interesting because many of us that have grown up in Christian circles would think, thank goodness we're past the law, right? And into this new covenant relationship found in Jesus, right? Uh, and, And that's not entirely a misunderstanding. Paul speaks in those terms. Thanks God. Thank, thank God that we have moved into this new era, this new season of knowing and relating to God through Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Um, however, here John describes it as grace. Uh, he's, he's referring to this. The law was a grace given that people would know the way of God and be able to walk with him. The law was a blessing. It was a grace to humanity that they may walk in the way of God in this world. However, how much more so grace upon grace has been given in that Jesus has come into this world that we might literally be able to watch and perceive what it looks like to walk in the way of God as God walks amongst us. What a beautiful thing. So as we zoom out, as we look at this prologue in John 1, what are, what are the main things that John is laying out for us? Well, first of all, it's the divinity of Jesus. He's describing Jesus as the word who was God, was with God. Jesus is the life and the light. Jesus is the son of God. Jesus is and has always been God. And Jesus is the creator. All things were created through him. Further, uh, John wants us to understand that Jesus is a light 
come into a dark world. And we'll see this play out over and over in the life of Jesus in the story that John will tell for us. Uh, It's kind of foreshadowing. He will be rejected by many, and he will be received by some. We'll see Jesus uh, teaching and healing, performing signs, and many people rejecting him, eventually to the point that even he'll be crucified by them. And yet some will receive him. John identifies those that receive Jesus will find life and light in him. I love the last verse. I think there's so much invitation for us in it. In verse 18, it said, No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. That Jesus came to make God known. And what an amazing invitation for us, friends, to be invited into relationship with the Creator, to know and to be known. And this is both an individual um, invitation for us and also a communal invitation for us. Personally, we each get to experience God. We each get to have a relationship with God that's dynamic and changing and there's conversation and there's um, layers of getting to know God and growing deeper in our relationship and our personal relationship with God. But then there's also this beautiful communal invitation where we are invited to know God and be a part of God's community, the people of God, the family of God, to live in community in a way that reflects more and more who God is. So we get invited to be a a child of God, loved and known, and also to walk with other children of God in a family that reflects divine love and grace. And I will be the first to tell you that we're not perfect. <laughs> and it gets real messy, <laughs> real quick. But that's that's okay, because there's divine love and grace in our midst. We get to be a family, learn what it's like to be that kind of a family, a family that is centered around the person of Jesus and his love and reflecting his love into our world. And so today, John invites us just the beginning of this journey to know God, to know Jesus, to put our faith in him, and to find life and light in him. Let's pray as we close today. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to dig into your word, uh, for the beautiful, poetic, uh, and and thought-out account that John has for us. God, we are grateful. And pray that as we listen to the words of an eyewitness, uh, God, that you would work in our hearts. Spirit, we invite you to uh, inspire in us belief and hope uh, that um, transcends the challenges of, of, of life in this world, in this moment. Uh, God, that gives us insight into your kingdom and your hope that is coming into this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, friends, thank you for joining us this morning. With that, we will close. I want to remind you there's coffee and cookie out here. We'll be doing Vine 101 in the sunroom after service in about 10 minutes. So if you'd like to stick around and join us for that, please do learn a little bit more about this journey that we're on together. Uh, Also, guitar lessons will be happening in here in about 15 minutes as well. Friends, thank you for joining us. Have a blessed week. We'll see you soon.